Welcome, welcome, thrice welcome to the HILR Francis Adelson Shakespeare Players production of A Midsummer Night's Dream. We are thrilled and honored to have with us today our own Queen Mab, the bringer of dreams. As Mercutio says to Romeo, she is the fairy's midwife, and she comes in shape no bigger than an agate stone. I refer, of course, to our founder, Frances Adelson, who flew up from Florida for today's performance. <laughs> possibly on fairy wings. <laughs> the 2009 issue of the American Shakespeare Center's study guide for audiences includes the admonition to turn off all electronic devices and no text messaging during the performance. <laughs> We sincerely hope that you will adhere to these stringent conditions. A Midsummer Night's Dream is surely a play that appealed to the Elizabethan crowd, and one can picture the old Globe Theater where the rambunctious goings-on on stage might well have been mirrored by an equally boisterous audience. You're on your own behavior on that one. Our play centers on a band of mismatched lovers who flee into the forest and find themselves bedeviled by fairies. As Theseus tells us in Act Five, lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. While in Shakespeare's time, one actor often played several roles, in our Midsummer Night's Dream, two actors often share the same role. Be warned, then, that the denizens of fairyland can make actors change before your very eyes. <laughs> it may take a few moments, but you'll discover that characters you recognize early in the play have been transformed and are played by others of your HILR friends. <clears throat> in our play today, Theseus says to the weaver, never excuse. If your play be a bad one, keep at least the excuses to yourself. With that promise, we invite you to all to join us in Fairyland. Now, fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour draws on apace. Four happy days bring in another moon. But Oma thinks how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires like to a stepdame or a dowager long withering out a young man's revenue. Go four, for four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Four nights will quickly dream away the time. And then the moon, like to a silver bow, new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. Go, Philistrate, stir up the youth of Athens to merriments and awake the pertinible spirit of mirth. <laughs> Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword and won thy love doing thee injuries, but I will wed thee in another key with pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. <laughs> <laughs> Happy be Theseus, our renowned duke. Thanks, good Aegeus. What's the news with thee? Full of vexation, come I, with complaint against my child, my daughter Hermia. Stand forth, Demetrius. My noble lord, this man hath my consent to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander. And, my gracious duke, this man hath bewitched the bosom of my child. With cunning hast thou filched my daughter's love and turned her obedience, which is due me, to stubborn harshness. And my gracious duke, as she is mine, I may dispose of her, which shall be either to this gentleman or to her death, according to our law. What say you, Hermia? Be advised, fair maid, to you your father should be as a god. Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So is Lysander. In himself he is. But in this case, wanting your father's voice, the other must be held the worthier. I would my father looked but with my eyes. Rather, your eyes must with his judgment look. So will I grow, so live, so die, my lord, ere I will yield my virgin patent up unto his lordship. Take time to pause. 
And by the next new moon, the sealing day betwixt my love and me, upon that day, <laughs> upon that day, prepare either to die or to abjure forever the society of men. Relent, sweet Hermia. And Lysander, yield thy crazed title to my certain right. You have her father's love, Demetrius. Let me have Hermia's. Do you marry him? <laughs> Scold for Lysander. True, he hath my love. And what is mine, my love shall render him. I am, my lord, as well derived as he, as well possessed. My love is more than his, and, which is more than all these boasts can be, I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. Why should not I then prosecute my right? Demetrius, I'll avouch it to his head, made love to Nidar's daughter Helena, and won her soul. And she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man. <laughs> For you, fair Hermia, look you, arm yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will, or else the law of Athens yields you up to death or to a vow of single life. Come, my Hippolyta. <laughs> what, what cheer, my love? <laughs> How now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? Be like for want of rain, which I could well beteem them from the tempest of my eyes. I, me, for what that I could ever read, could ever hear by tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth. For either it was different in blood. Oh, cross too high to be enthralled to low. Or else it stood upon the choice of friends. Oh, hell, to choose love by another's eyes. And if there were a sympathy and choice, war, death, or sickness did lay siege to it, making it momentary as a sound, swift as a shadow, short as any dream, brief as the lightning in the collied night, the jaws of darkness do devour it up. So quick bright things come to confusion. I have a widow aunt, a dowager of great revenue, and she hath no child. From Athens is her house remote seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, may I marry thee, and to that place the shark Athenian law cannot pursue us. If thou lovest me then, steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in the wood, a league without the town, there will I stay for thee. My good Lysander, I swear to thee, by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow with a golden head. Tomorrow, truly, will I meet with thee. Keep promise, love. Look, here comes Helena. God speed, fair Helena, wither away. Call you me fair? That fair again, I say. Demetrius loves your fair. Oh, happy fair. Teach me how you look and with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius's heart. I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. Oh, that your frowns would teach my smiles such skill. The more I hate, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hateth me. His <coughs> folly, Helena, is no fault of mine. None but your beauty. Would that fault were mine. Take comfort. He no more shall see my face. Why, Sander and myself will fly this place. Helen, to you our minds we will unfold. Through Athens' gates have we devised to steal. And in the wood, where often you and I upon faint primrose bed were wont to lie, emptying our bosoms of their counsel sweet, there my Lysander and myself shall meet. And thence from Athens turn away our eyes. Farewell, sweet playfellow, pray thou for us. How happy some or other some can be. 
through Athens, I am as fair as she. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eye, he hailed down oaths that he was only mine. I will go tell him of fair Hermia's flight, then to the woods will he tomorrow night pursue her. And for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense. But herein mean I to enrich my pain, to have his love thither and back again. Here is the scroll of every man's name which is thought fit through all Athens to play in our interlude before the Duke and Duchess on his wedding day at night. First, good Peter Quince, say what the play is about, and then read the names of the actors, and so grow to a point. Mary, our play is the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. Ooh, a very good piece of work, I assure you, and a merry. Now, good Peter Quince, call forth the actors uh, from the scroll, and masters, spread yourselves. <clears throat> Answer as I call you, Nick Bottom, the weaver. Ready. <laughs> Name what part I am for, and proceed. You, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus? A lover? Or a tyrant? A lover who kills himself most gallant for love. That will ask some tears in the true performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look to their eyes. I will move storms. I will condole in some measure. To the rest, my chief humor is for a tyrant. I could play Urkley's rarely, or a part to Terracatian to make all split. Francis, the raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates, and Phoebus' car shall shine from far and make and mar the Phoebus' fates. Uh, Francis, flute, say... Well, that was lofty. Uh, now, name the rest of the players. Uh, Francis, uh, This is Hercules' vein, a tyrant's vein. A lover is more condoling. <laughs> Uh, Francis Flute, the bellows mender. Here, Peter Quince. Uh, Fla Francis Flute, you must take Fisby on you. Fisby? What is Fisby? A wandering knight? It is a lady that Pyramus must love. May faith let me not play a woman. I have a beard coming. That, that's all one. You shall play it in a mask, and you can speak as small as you will. And I may hide my face. Let me play Fisby, too. I will speak in a monstrous little voice. Fisby, Fisby. Ah, heaven is dear. Thy Fisby, dear, and lady, dear. No, no, you must play Pyramus. You, Flute, Fisby. Well, proceed. Robin Starveling, the tailor. Oh, here, Peter Quince. Robin Starveling, you must play Fisby's mother. Uh, Tom Snout, the tinker. Here, Peter Quince. Uh, you, Pyramus's father. Myself, Fisby's father. And Snug, the joiner. Uh, you, the lion parts. And uh, I have a, here I have a play fitted. Have you the lion's part written? If it be, pray you give it me, for I am slow of study. 
<laughs> you, you can, you can uh, may do it extempore. For it is nothing but roaring. <laughs> Let me play the lion too. <laughs> I will roar so that I will do any man's heart good to hear me. I will roar and make the duke say, let him roar again. Let him roar again. And you should do it too terribly. You would fright the duchess and the ladies that they should shriek. And that, that would hang us all. Oh, that would hang us every other son. I grant you, friends, that if you should fight the ladies out of their wits, they would have no more discretion but to hang us. But I will aggravate my voice and speak so softly as any sucking dove. I will roar you as any nightingale. You can play no part but Pyramus. For Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man, as one shall see on a summer's day. Therefore you needs play Pyramus. But come, masters, here are your parts. And I entreat you and request you and desire you to con them by tomorrow night and meet me in the palace wood, a mile without the town. By moonlight, there will we rehearse. I pray you... Fail me not. We will meet, and there we may rehearse most obscenely and courageously. Take pains. Be perfect. Adieu. <laughs> How now, spirit? Whither wander you? Over hill, over dale, thorough bush, thorough briar. Ah, do you wander everywhere, swifter than the moon is sphere. And I serve the fairy queen to dew her orbs upon the green. I must go and seek some dewdrops here and hang a pearl in every cow's lips ear. <coughs> Farewell, thou lob of spirits. I'll be gone. Our queen and all our elves come here anon. The king doth hold his revels here tonight. Take queen, take care the queen come not within his sight. For Oberon is passing fell and wrath, because that she for her attendant hath a lovely boy. Stolen from an Indian king, she never had so sweet a changeling. And jealous Oberon would have the child knight of his train to trace the forest wild. But she, perforce, withholds the loved boy. And now they never travel through gro grove or green by fountain clear or spangled starlight sheen, but they do square. And all their elves for fear creep into acorn cups and hide them there. Either I mistake your shape in making quite, or else you are that shrewd and knavish sprite called Robin Goodfellow. Are not you he that frights the maidens of the village tree? Those that hobgoblin call you in sweet puff, you do their work and they shall have good luck. Are not you he? Thou speaks to right. I am that merry wanderer of the night. I jest with Oberon and make him smile when I, a fat and bean-fed horse, beguile with neighing in likeness of a filly foal. And sometime lurk I in a gossip's bowl in very likeness of a roasted crab. And when she drinks, against her lips I bob and on her withered dewlaps pour the ale. And then the whole choir hold their hips and laugh. 
But room, room fairy, here comes Oberon. And here my mistress, would that he were gone. <laughs> Ill met by moonlight, proud Titania. How now, jealous Oberon? Fairy skip hence, I have forsworn his bed and company. Tarry, rash wanton, am not I thy lord? Oh, then I must be thy lady. But I know when thou hast wandered away from fairyland to amorous Phyllida. And why are you here, come from the farthest depths of India, but that thy bouncing Amazon, thy buskin mistress, thy warrior love to Theseus must be wedded, and you have come to bid their bed joy and prosperity. How canst thou thus for shame, Titania, glance at my credit with Hippolyta, knowing I know thy love to Theseus? Oh, these are the very forgeries of jealousy. Never since the middle summer spring have we met on hill or dale, forest or mead, or in the beached margins of the sea to dance our ringlets to the whistling wind but with thy brawls thou hast disturbed our sport. Thus the wind, piping to us in vain as in revenge, has sucked up from the seas contagious fogs, which falling upon the land have every pelting river made so proud that they have overborne their continents. The ox has therefore stretched his yoke in vain, the plowman lost his sweat, and the green corn has rotted ere its youth attained a beard, and no knight is now with him nor Carol blessed. And the moon, governess of the floods, pale in her anger, washes all the air, and from this distemperature we see the seasons alter. Hoary-headed frosts fall in the fresh lap of the crimson rose, chiding autumn, angry winter, lose their wanted liveries. And the mazed world, by their increase, knows not which is which. And the same forgeries of evil come from our descent, from our debate. We are the parents and original. Do you amend it, then? It lies in you. I do but beg a little changeling boy to be my henchman. Oh, set your heart at rest. The fairyland buys not this child of me. His mother was a votress of my order, and in the spiced Indian air by night, full oft has she gossiped by my side, and watched with me as the market traders belt themselves upon the flood. <laughs> and we have laughed to see the sails conceive and grow big-bellied in the wanton wind. But she, with swimming and with wonderful gait following, her womb enriched my, my, my young squire, would imitate and sail upon the land. But she, being mortal, of this child did die, and for her sake do I rear up this boy, and for her sake I will not part with him. How long within this wood intend you stay? Well, perchance till after Theseus' wedding day. But if you would patiently dance in our rounds and see our midnight revels, come with us. If not, shun me, and I will avoid thy haunts. Give me that boy, and I will go with thee. Oh, not for thy fairy kingdom. Fairies away. We shall chide downright if I longer stay. Well, go thy way. Thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. My gentle Puck, come hither. Thou rememberest since once I sat upon a promontory and heard a mermaid on a dolphin's back uttering such dulcet and harmonious <coughs> breath that the rude sea grew civil at her song. That very time I saw, but thou couldst not, flying between the cold moon and the earth, Cupid, all armed. A certain aim he took, and loosed his love shaft smartly from his bow, 
as it should pierce a hundred thousand hearts. Yet Mark died where the bolt of Cupid fell. It fell upon a little western flower before milk white, now purple with love's wound. Fetch me that flower, the herb I showed thee once. The juice of it on sleeping eyelids laid will make or man or woman madly dote upon the next live creature that it sees. Fetch me this herb, and be thou here again ere the leviathan can swim a leak. I'll put a girdle round the earth in 40 minutes. <laughs> Having once this juice, I'll watch Titania when she is asleep and drop the liquor of it in her eyes. The next thing then she waking looks upon, be it on lion, bear, or wolf, or bull, she shall pursue it with the soul of love. And ere I take this charm from off her sight, I'll make her render up her page to me. But who comes here? I am invisible. <laughs>